The Lives of the Saints by Father Alban Butler, September 9th, St. Peter Claver. But it was also the English who, through such infamous characters as Sir John Hawkins, played a very important part in the establishment of that same traffic between Africa and the New World in the 16th century. And among the true heroes who gave their lives in defense of the victims of that sinister exploitation belonging to countries that did not receive the doctrines of the Reformation, the greatest of all was undoubtedly St. Peter Claver, a native of that Catholic Spain, which was then at the height of its glory and power, but which was for most Englishmen nothing more than a country of pirates, of unscrupulous imperialists, and of a supposedly cruel religion. Peter was born in the town of Verdu in the region of Catalonia around 1581, and as he showed signs of possessing great qualities of intelligence and spirit from his childhood, he was assigned to the church and was sent to study at the University of Barcelona. There he finished his studies with all kinds of distinctions, and after receiving minor orders, he decided to carry out his determination to offer himself to the Society of Jesus, which received him willingly. At the age of 20, he made his novitiate in Tarragona. From there, he was sent to the College of Montesioni in Palma de Mallorca. Then came an encounter with St. Alphonsus Rodriguez, the college porter, but with a reputation for sanctity far above his humble office, an encounter that set the course in Peter Claver's life. From then on, he studied the science of the saints at the feet of the lay brother, and Alphonsus, as he got to know the young student better, appreciated his qualities and saw in him more and more clearly the right man for a new, arduous, and hitherto completely neglected task. Alfonso kindled in Pedro's mind and heart the idea of coming to the aid of the thousands and thousands who found themselves without spiritual resources in the colonies of the New World. Years later, Peter Claver revealed that St. Alphonsus had not only foretold him that he would go to America, but that he told him exactly where he was to work. Prompted by these exhortations, Peter spoke to his provincial about offering himself for the missions in the West Indies and was told that in due course his superiors would decide on his vocation. In the meantime, he was sent to Barcelona to study theology, and after two years following a new application, he was appointed to represent the province of Aragon in the mission of Spanish Jesuits being sent to the colony of New Granada. He left the lands of Spain for good in April 1610 and, after an eventful and slow journey, landed in Cartagena, in the territory of what is now the Republic of Colombia. He then went to the Jesuit house in Santa Fe to complete his theological studies and was used as a nurse and sacristan as well as a porter and cook. Afterwards, he moved to the new Jesuit house in Tunja in order to do his third probation and in 1615 he returned to Cartagena, where he was ordained a priest. At that time, the slave trade had been operating in the two Americas for almost a century, with its main center in the port of Cartagena, which, due to its location, lent itself to establishing a kind of warehouse for human merchandise. On the other hand, the slave market had just received a great increase when it was discovered that the Indians lacked the physical resistance necessary to support the hard work in the gold and silver mines, and consequently, there was great demand for blacks from Angola and the Congo. These were acquired by traders in West Africa at the rate of two crowns per head when they were not exchanged for some provisions and sold in America for 200 crowns each. The conditions under which the slaves were transported across the Atlantic were incredibly cruel and inhuman. Suffice it to say that the traffickers calculated that one third of each shipment was lost by the death of the slaves. But in spite of all this, every year, an average of 10,000 slaves were landed in Cartagena alive. Pope Paul III and many other authorities and world personalities condemned the enormous crime, but the flourishing of the supreme vileness, as Pope Pius IX called the slave trade, continued. The most that the owners did in response to the church's incessant appeals was to have their slaves baptized, and that measure proved counterproductive. The Negroes received no religious instruction, no protection from their exploiters, no relief from their miserable condition, so that they came to regard baptism as the sign and symbol of their oppression and their misfortune. The clergy were powerless to remedy this state of affairs and did no more than protest and devote themselves as much as possible to their individual ministry to give corporal and material remedy to the greatest number of beings among the hundreds of thousands of suffering men, women, and children.
The priests had no charitable funds at their disposal. They did not have the support of well-disposed people. They almost always ran up against the obstacles and barriers placed in their way by the proprietors or were discouraged by the obvious hostility of the traffickers and often found themselves rejected by the very blacks they wanted to help. When Father Claver was ordained in Cartagena, the slave relief movement was led by a great Jesuit missionary who spent 40 years in his service, Father Alfonso de Sandoval. After working under him, the young Pedro Claver committed himself to be the slave of the blacks forever. Although he was shy by nature and did not have much self-confidence, he threw himself into the work with absolute determination and gave himself to it, not with delirious and misguided enthusiasm, but with method and true tenacity. He procured numerous helpers, volunteers, or for pay, and as soon as a ship loaded with slaves entered the port, Pedro Claver would come to the docks to wait for him. The blacks were disembarked and, after a count to verify the number of casualties, they were locked in corrals or enclosed areas, where the voyeurs, as Sandoval's father calls them, attracted by curiosity but not daring to get too close, would go. Hundreds of men who, for several weeks, had been crowded in the narrow holds of a ship without receiving even the minimum care that is lavished on a shipment of cattle were piled up again in fenced spaces, the good and healthy mixed with the sick and dying under a scorching sun in a climate unbearable for its heat and humidity. So horrible was the spectacle, and so repugnant the conditions, that a friend of Father Claver, who once accompanied him, did not dare to return, and Father de Sandoval himself, as written in one of the relations of his province, on hearing that a cargo of slaves was about to arrive in port, began to sweat coldly while a deathly pallor faded his skin, remembering the tremendous fatigue and indescribable work of the previous occasions. The experiences and practices of several years could not accustom him to so much pain. Through those corrals, enclosures, or sheds, Pedro Claver would enter, loaded with medicines and food, with bread, aguardiente, lemons, tobacco, and other things that he could distribute among the blacks. Many of them were too frightened or too sick to accept the gifts. First we have to talk to them with hands, and then we try to communicate with them by word of mouth, Father Claver said. Upon encountering any dying people, he would stop to baptize them and also gather all the children born during the journey to receive baptism. Throughout the time, the blacks spent in those corrals so closely packed together that they actually had to sleep next to each other, St. Peter Claver remained with them, busy tending to the bodies of the sick and the souls of all. Unlike most clergymen, Father Claver did not consider that his ignorance of the language exempted him from the obligation to instruct them in the truths of religion, the rules of morality, and the words of Christ that brought to their spirits the indispensable consolation. For his communications, the Father had seven interpreters, one of whom spoke four African dialects, and with their help he instructed the slaves and prepared them for baptism in grupos and individually. They were very backward and slow to understand, Father Claver said, adding that he himself had insurmountable difficulties in learning the language and making himself understood. That is why he resorted to pictures and images of our Lord on the cross or naive illustrations that presented popes, princes, and other great white personages who watched with joy as a black man was baptized. But above all, he tried to instill in them a certain degree of self-respect, of dignity, to give them at least an idea of the very high value of a human being redeemed by the blood of Christ, even if they were despised and exploited as slaves. Likewise, to awaken in them pain and repentance for their faults and vices, he showed them a frightening representation of hell, which he wielded with a threatening gesture as a warning. Then, making himself understood as he could, he assured them that they were loved much more than they could think, and that the love of God should not be outraged by the practice of evil, by hatred and sensuality. It was necessary to take each one in particular and repeat to him to exhaustion the simplest of teachings, such as making the sign of the cross or learning the words of the short prayer that all should know. Jesus Christ, Son of God, you will be my Father and my Mother and all my good. I love you. It pains me to have sinned against you. Lord, I love you very, very, very much. The difficulties he encountered in teaching are demonstrated by the fact that in the collective baptisms, each group of ten catechumens was given the same name so that they would remember it. It is estimated that in 40 years, St. Peter Claver instructed and baptized 
more than 300,000 slaves in this way. When there was time and occasion, he also taught them with great labor what the sacrament of penance meant and how to practice it. It is said that in one year he heard the confessions of about 5,000 blacks. He was tireless in his efforts to convince them to avoid occasions of sin, and with the same determination he insisted that the owners take care of the souls of their slaves. The priest became the representation of moral force in Cartagena, and the story is told of a black man who managed to free himself from the siege of a light woman in the streets of the city just by telling her, Look out! Here comes Father Claver! When the slaves were finally gathered together to be sent to the mines and plantations, St. Peter went out of his way to give them his recommendations and advice, since it would be very difficult for him to see them again. He had absolute confidence that God would watch over them, and unlike some social reformers of later times, he did not think that even the most brutal of slave owners was a despicable barbarian to whom God's mercy could not reach. Plantation owners, encomenderos, and landowners also had souls equal to those of the blacks, so St. Peter appealed to the souls of the local lords to administer physical and spiritual justice, not so much for the good of others as for his own. To cynical or skeptical spirits, the saint's confidence in human goodness must have seemed puerile, and no doubt everyone thought that St. Peter would be disappointed very often. It is impossible, however, to overlook the fact that even the infamies of the cruelest Spanish encomendero could not compare with the ordinary treatment meted out to their slaves in the 17th and 18th centuries by the more upright English planters of Jamaica, for example, for their physical cruelties were hellish and their moral indifference could only be described as diabolical. The laws of Spain for its colonies authorized, at least, the marriage of slaves forbade the separation of their families, protected them from punishment and their capture once they were free. St. Peter Claver did everything in his power to see that these laws were observed. Every spring after Easter, St. Peter would make a tour of the plantations, mines, and haciendas near Cartagena in order to see how his blacks were doing. He was not always well received. The owners complained that he wasted the slaves' time with his sermons, prayers, and chants. The ladies claimed that for a long time after the blacks flocked to church during the priest's visits, it was materially impossible to enter the church. And if perchance the servants got a little out of hand, the blame was laid on Father Claver. What kind of a man am I if I can't do a little good without causing great confusion? He used to ask himself. But that did not discourage him, and he did not cease in his labors even when the ecclesiastical authorities lent an ear to the complaints of his enemies. Most of the stories concerning the heroism or miraculous powers of St. Peter Claver refer to the solicitous care he had for the blacks when they were sick, but he still found time to care for others who were suffering apart from the slaves. In Cartagena, there were two hospitals, one, that of San Sebastian, attended by the brothers of San Juan de Dios, who took care of all the cases in general. The other, that of San Lazaro, was destined to the lepers, those attacked by contagious diseases, and those who suffered from the evil, called Fire of San Antonio. St. Peter unfailingly visited the two hospitals every week, relieved the material needs of the patients, and administered such effective spiritual consolations that many criminals and hardened sinners repented and did penance after chatting with him. He also exercised his apostolate among Protestant merchants and sailors, and even achieved the conversion of an Anglican dignitary who claimed to be Archdeacon of London and whom he met while visiting prisoners of war on a ship anchored in the bay. For temporal considerations, the English pastor did not allow himself to be taken in immediately, but he fell ill, was taken to the hospital of San Sebastian, and before dying, entered the Catholic Church guided by Father Claver. Many Englishmen from Cartagena followed his example. Less successful was the Jesuit saint in his efforts to convert the Muslims who came to the port and who, as Claver's biographer says, it is well known that among all the peoples of the world, they are the most obstinate in their errors. But instead, he returned to the right path a large number of renegade Moors and Turks, although one of them took 30 years to be convinced, and it was even necessary for him to have a vision of Our Lady to surrender. Also, the criminals condemned to death enjoyed the beneficial influence of Father Claver. The records affirm that there was not a single execution in Cartagena during the existence of the priest, 
without him being present to console the executed, by his words, perhaps by his presence alone, many hardened criminals spent their last hours in prayer and weeping for their sins. And many, many, many more whom human justice had not condemned came to seek him out in the confessional, where he used to spend up to 15 consecutive hours in the task of reconvening, advising, encouraging, and absolving. His spring missions in the fields, in the course of which he avoided, as far as possible, staying in the big houses of the owners to seek refuge in the huts of the slaves, were continued in the autumn by other more difficult missions, among the merchants, traffickers, and sailors, who at that time arrived in great numbers in Cartagena and increased the disorder and vice in the port. Sometimes, St. Peter would spend the whole day in the main square of the city, where the four main streets led off, to preach to anyone who stopped to listen to him. After being the apostle of the blacks, he was the apostle of the whole city of Cartagena. Such an enormous work received the help of God, who granted Father Claver the gifts that he always granted to his apostles to work miracles, to prophesy, and to read in the hearts. Few have been the saints who developed their activities in such adverse and repugnant circumstances as he did, but even those mortifications of the flesh were not enough, since the saint continually used instruments for the most severe penances. Many times he prayed alone in his cell with a crown of thorns on his head and a very heavy cross on his shoulders. He avoided the most innocent gifts to his senses, lest they should divert him from the path of sacrifice he had chosen. Therefore, he never used for himself the indulgence and kindness he used for others. Once, when his apostolic zeal was praised, he replied, It must be so, and there is nothing extraordinary about it. It is the result of my enthusiastic and impetuous temperament. If it were not for this work, I would be an unbearable nuisance to myself and to others. And, lest anyone should praise his apparent lack of sensitivity in dealing with the most repugnant diseases, he said, if being a saint consists in having no sense of smell and a stomach that is foolproof, it may be that I am a saint. In the year 1650, St. Peter Claver traveled along the coast to preach among the blacks. But as soon as he began his journey, an illness attacked his weak and exhausted body, and he had to return to his residence in Cartagena. Shortly after, a violent smallpox epidemic broke out in the city, and one of the first victims among the Jesuit fathers was the saintly missionary who was on the verge of burial. But after receiving the last sacraments, he returned to life, although he was undone. For the rest of his life, the pains did not leave him for a moment. His trembling limbs could not support him, and it was impossible for him to officiate at Mass. He was forced to abandon all activity and only occasionally heard confessions, especially those of his dear friend Doña Isabel de Urbina, who had always generously supported his work. Occasionally, he would take himself to a hospital or prison to attend to a dying person or a person condemned to death. Once, when a shipment of slaves arrived in Cartagena from a previously unexploited region of Africa, Father Claver regained his former energy. He was carried to the docks and did not rest until he found an interpreter who helped him gather the children to baptize them and give some instructions to the adults. But that recovery was momentary. St. Peter spent most of his time in his cell, not only inactive, but forgotten and even abandoned. The number of Jesuits in the house of Cartagena had been greatly reduced, and the few who remained had all their time occupied in the multiple duties of their ministry, increased by the persistence of the epidemic. But even so, it is inexplicable the indifference they showed towards the saint. Doña Isabel and her sister remained faithful to his friendship and were the only ones who visited him, together with his former assistant, Brother Nicholas Gonzalez. Apart from these three, St. Peter Claver saw no one but a young black man who attended him, but who was impatient and brusque, and who often left the old priest for days at a time without the slightest attention. Once, the authorities remembered that he still existed because complaints arose that Father Claver had fallen into the habit of rebaptizing blacks. Naturally, the saint had never done such a thing except conditionally in case of doubt, but he was nevertheless forbidden to baptize in the future. I regret, he once wrote, that I have not always imitated the example of the ass. When he is spoken ill of and insulted, he turns a deaf ear. When he is starved, he turns a deaf ear. When he is overburdened, he turns a deaf ear. When he is despised and abandoned, he still turns a deaf ear. He never complains under any circumstances, for he is but an ass. So should the servants of God be.
In the summer of 1654, Father Diego Ramirez Farina arrived in Cartagena from Spain with a commission from the king to work for the blacks. St. Peter Claver rejoiced so much that he rose from his bed to welcome his successor. A few days later, he heard Doña Isabel's confession and told her that this would be his last. On September 6th, after attending Mass and receiving communion, he told Nicolas Gonzalez, I am going to die. That same afternoon, he fell ill and fell into a coma. The rumor that he was dying quickly circulated throughout the city, and suddenly everyone seemed to remember the existence of the saint. A veritable crowd came to kiss his hands before it was too late. The people who came stripped the cell and even the bed of the saint of everything they could carry away as a relic. St. Peter Claver never regained consciousness and died two days later, on September 8, 1654, the Feast of the Nativity of Our Lady. The civil authorities who had looked coldly on the solicitude of the priest for the unfortunate blacks and the priests, who had described his zeal as indiscreet and his energetic activity as a waste, then vied to honor his memory. The magistrates of the city ordered that he be buried with great pomp at the expense of the municipal treasury, and the vicar general of the diocese officiated at the funeral. The blacks and Indians had a mass celebrated at their own expense, to which the Spanish authorities were invited. The church was a sea of lights. The choir sang, and the treasurer of the Church of Papayan pronounced a funeral oration that was a praise to the exalted virtues, sanctity, heroism, and stupendous miracles of Father Claver. From then on, no one forgot St. Peter Claver, and his fame spread throughout the world. He was canonized in 1888 at the same time as his friend, St. Alphonsus Rodriguez. Pope Leo XIII declared him patron of all missions among the blacks in all parts of the world. His feast is celebrated in America and in many other places.